Uh, welcome, and uh, thank you all for coming to this very special event, uh, especially on a night like this. Um, my name is John Argo. I'm the president of the Graduate School of Management Alumni Association um, and an alumni. Uh, it's a great crowd we have here tonight. I want to welcome all the GSM alumni, uh, students and business partners, and welcome uh, our guests affiliated with the UC Davis School of Education. Um, I'd like to let you know, uh, take a moment to let you know um, what our alumni board is working on. Uh, we're working hard to extend the school's network and we're excited about what we've accomplished so far this year in helping the school meet its strategic goals. Um, we have a few board members here tonight. Uh, would you stand if you're both here? Uh, Randall Fairchild and Brian Hoblett. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, we would also love more involvement from our fellow alumni. Um, so please don't hesitate to approach me or, or any one of the directors uh, uh, here tonight for, uh, with your ideas and let us know uh, if you'd like to help out. Uh, one of the ways uh, to get involved is to have your company become a GSM business partner. Uh, uh, for a fairly modest donation, your company uh, can enjoy many of the benefits with that program, uh, including complimentary use of the school's working professional uh, MBA campuses uh, here in Sacramento and in San Ramon and uh, attendance at uh, uh, many of the terrific events we put on. Uh, information about the Business Partnership Program uh, is available at our registration table. You can talk to me also, uh, any one of the directors, or Anya Reed. Uh, Anya, are you here? She's the woman with the plan. Um, and now it's my uh, genuine pleasure to introduce the Dean uh, and Professor of Management at the UC Davis Graduate School of Management. Um, Stephen Corral. Steve? Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, event that I think will be absolutely magical tonight. This is going to be a lot of fun uh, for all of us, and we've had a great response. We had 307 people RSVP for this, so terrific uh, response to hear our speakers tonight. So. Um, just beginning with some uh, thank yous, so a special welcome to our many alumni uh, in the audience, and also we're delighted to have uh, the sponsorship of our Alumni Association Board of Directors, who are generously uh, hosting our networking reception uh, after our speaker event tonight. Our event also brought to you in partnership with colleagues at the UC Davis uh, School of Education, and we're delighted to have Dean Harold Levine here with us tonight and our guests from the School of Education. Also, please uh, welcome my colleague, Dean Winston Coe, Dean of the UC Davis uh, College of Mathematical and Physical Sciences, as well as colleagues from the UC Davis Health System, uh, the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing Center, and the Center for Biophotonics, and others. Also joining us are many generous benefactors to the Graduate School of Management who support us financially, hire our students and alumni, and give back their time and expertise to advance the mission of the school. I want to recognize members of our business partnership program, which include many of the region's top corporations. Their generous contributions help us provide an MBA experience that's ranked among the best in the world. Our business partners with us this evening include Capital Public Radio, Comstock's Business Magazine, First Northern Bank, Five Star Bank, Genentech, Hewlett Packard, Intel Corporation, Kaiser Permanente, Click Nation Corporation, Murphy Austin Adams Schoenfeld LLP, and Sacramento Municipal Utility District. So thank you for all the contributions that keep our Graduate School of Management a vibrant research and teaching community. So let's thank our business partners. So I also want to take this opportunity to uh, share with you a few of the ways that we are partnering with uh, uh, Mayor Johnson and business leaders to uh, help build economic prosperity here in our region. I've uh, personally had the honor of serving uh, as the head of the Green and Clean Technology Task Force for the Mayor's GreenWise Sacramento Initiative. Uh, I'm sure virtually all of you know about this now. It's been, uh, had great publicity 
and the mayor presented the uh, report of the GreenWise initiative at his State of the City remarks last month. He has a bold vision to transform Sacramento into the Emerald Valley, the greenest region in the country and a leading hub for clean technology. As many of you know, uh, UC Davis is an international research powerhouse in sustainability, environmental issues, and clean tech, and working together with other institutions here in the region, we believe that UC Davis can be to the green economy what Stanford University was to Silicon Valley in information technology. As part of this effort last April, we teamed up with the mayor to launch a UC Davis MBA mayoral fellows program. This program allows our MBA students to put their management talent to work in areas where public policy and business interact, including economic development, housing, education, and the arts. Our second group of students will begin their fellowships this spring. And to better prepare our graduates, this fall we'll launch a new innovative MBA curriculum. This is the most fundamental renewal of the curriculum in the, in the school's history and it further integrates globalization, responsible business practices, ethics, and sustainability. This new curriculum is the culmination of over 10 months of collaborative work by our faculty, alumni, students, and business leaders. This new curriculum reinforces our core strengths of values-based leadership, emphasis on teamwork, and turning ideas into action to solve strategic business issues. And a lot of these issues are tied up in the concept of leading organizational change, which is our theme tonight. So let me now move to introduction of, of our distinguished speakers, Mayor Kevin Johnson and Ms. Michelle Ree. So elected in November of 2008, Kevin Johnson is the 55th mayor of Sacramento and the first African American to serve in that office. Mayor Johnson, who is a native of Sacramento, strongly believes that in order to be a great city, we must have great schools, and he's committed to identifying ways to strategically drive education reform. During the first two years of his administration, Mayor Johnson has accomplished a number of uh, objectives to ensure all Sacramento students have the op opportunity to attend excellent public schools. In addition to creating a formal partnership uh, between the city and area school districts, and hosting four major education summits. Mayor Johnson serves as co-chair for U.S. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan's Mayor, Mayor's Advisory Council and chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors Task Force on Public Education. <laughs> Mayor Johnson is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. His concern and passion for children and education prompted, prompted President George Bush to honor Johnson as the 411th point of light. <laughs> 411 is still pretty good. <laughs> Michelle Ree is the founder and CEO of Students First, a national education reform organization now headquartered in Sacramento. Michelle, welcome to Sacramento. <laughs> students First is guided by Michelle's core vision to put students first. She's been working for the last 18 years to give, to give children the skills and knowledge they'll need to compete in a changing world. Through her own experience in the classroom as a Teach for America Corps member in a Harlem Park community school in Baltimore City, she gained tremendous respect for the hard work that teachers do every day. And in 1997, Ms. Ree founded the New Teacher Project to bring more excellent teachers to the classroom across the country. On June 12, 2007, Mayor Adrian Fenty of Washington, D.C. appointed Chancellor Ree to lead the District of Columbia Public Schools, a school district serving more than 47,000 students in 123 schools. Under her leadership, the worst performing school district in the country became the only major city system to see double digit gains in both their state reading and state math scores in seventh, eighth, and 10th grade over a three year period. Michelle currently serves on the advisory boards for the National Council on Teacher Quality, the National Center for Alter Alternative Certification, and Project REACH of the University of Phoenix School of Education. 
She has a bachelor's degree in government from Cornell University, which is also my alma mater, and a master's in public policy from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. So I know I speak for all of us when I say we're delighted to have both Mayor Johnson and Ms. Ree here participating in this distinguished speaker event tonight. So please join me in welcoming Mayor Kevin Johnson and Michelle Ree. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I've got a, a series of, of questions that I'm eager to ask uh, our two speakers tonight. Uh, and those, uh, and after, after my questions, we will then open the floor uh, for your questions. So as we're talking, be thinking about what questions you'd like to ask the mayor and, and Ms. Ree. So let me start off uh, with two themes. I'd like to talk about um, the why of organizational change. In other words, what is it that, uh, what influence in your lives have led you to be uh, leaders of organizational change? And the second theme I'd like to explore is the how. In other words, how have you uh, succeeded in leading organizational change uh, efforts and what are the principles and guidelines that, that the two of you have used uh, as leaders for organizational change? It's really fascinating to, to observe their, uh, their careers. They've uh, worked in two sectors, namely uh, uh, government and public education, where organizational change is often difficult. Uh, often uh, uh, many, uh, lots of organizational inertia that, that occurs in these, in these <coughs> sectors, but both uh, the mayor and Ms. Ree have been extraordinarily successful. Dean, she was smart enough to get out, and I'm still <laughs> stuck in. <laughs> They've been both extraordinarily successful in, in leading uh, organizational change efforts, and that's really what we want to, uh, to talk about tonight. And, and I also want to say a, a special thanks to the two of them. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time that they have appeared together in Sacramento at a speaking event. So this is uh, the first time that, they're, that the dynam dynamic duo is together on the stage. So let's thank them for that. Uh. Okay, well, ladies first, so let's begin with Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your background um, and uh, what, what values did your parents instill in you that led you to be interested in public education uh, and to try to improve it? And it's especially interesting to, to hear your thoughts about your commitment to public education but if, because, in fact, much of your own personal experience has been in private education. So can you tell us a little bit about the, the evolution of your commitment to public education? Sure. So I uh, was incredibly fortunate growing up, uh, starting from seventh grade, attended uh, private schools. Was, uh, went to a country day school where there were probably 15 kids in a class. Uh, in, in my entire grade, there were 55 students, and that was the largest group ever to go through uh, the school. It was uh, an incredibly nurturing environment, very, very rigorous. Uh, you know, you hear lots of stories about people who felt ill-prepared for college. Uh, I felt sort of over-prepared for college <laughs> in lots of ways. Um, and, but probably what was interesting was the fact that my father, who was a physician, uh, was very different from most Korean men of his generation in that he was very sort of socially and civic minded. And so he used to tell us all the time when we were growing up, you know, everything that you have and everything that you've accomplished is not because you're special at all or talented, it's because you happen to have been lucky enough to be born into this family with all of the trappings that come with it and all of the opportunities and privileges that come, come with that. And so the kids who are growing up in inner city Toledo who have none of what you have, it's not because they're not talented, not because they're not able and smart, it's simply because of, of the fact of where they were born. And it was that sort of mindset that he instilled in me from a very young age that kind of made me always thinking about, always think about what other people did not have access to that I did. Uh, growing up through high school, um, I spent a lot of time, uh, a high school boyfriend of mine's uh, mother. <laughs> <laughs> now, now. <laughs> 
didn't mean anything to me, though. Uh, uh, <laughs> she was an inner city uh, school teacher, and I remember volunteering in her classroom one day, and it was so different from anything that I had ever experienced that it, it, it just sort of inspired me and kept me coming back. And so since that point, I was really uh, sort of captured by this thought of kids living in uh, under-resourced, uh, less privileged environments, not having an equal chance in life just because of, of the luck of their birth. And I just thought it was the most un-American thing that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> That's great. Um, how many of you saw uh, Michelle on Oprah back in November? Okay, that's been pretty good. <laughs> pretty good proportion. So I, I, I can't resist <coughs> to ask a kind of a fun question. What, what was the most interesting question she asked you? What was the most interesting? So first, I'll give you a few tidbits about Oprah. Um, oh, good. We're all looking forward to that. <laughs> she's really short. <laughs> I, I don't know if you. I, I don't know if you'd ever sort of realize this, but uh, she's really short, and so. When, the, when I was on the, the first time, she was sort of walking by and I almost didn't notice because she was really <laughs> short and she was carrying her uh, heels with her. That happened to be probably like six inches high. And so she came up and she, had <coughs> it, uh, she sat down and she told the camera crew, she said, uh, she said, these are my 10 minute shoes. I have 10 minutes in the shoes. And so uh, when she put them on and they, they made her stand up to do a couple of, of, of shots and and she'd be standing there while they were getting the cameras ready, and she'd say, nine minutes. <laughs> um, Eight minutes. Yeah, exactly. So that's my tidbit about Oprah. I, I think the, the most exciting thing about me being able to be on the show was just the fact that she feels incredibly passionately about public education, and she's decided to take this issue on. Uh, she said to me um, when I was on the show, and we were, they turned to a clip, where the National Teachers Union president was, was speaking about something. She looked at me, she's mm, like, that must have been interesting. Yeah. She said, you, you are going to get me in so much trouble. <laughs> um, and I think I, I, I did proceed to that. <laughs> That's why we want you here tonight. You may, <laughs> may have a little bit of controversy as well. So, uh, well, that's, that's fun. It's fun to, to, to hear about that. I didn't know she was that short. Uh, they say the same thing about Tom Cruise. I don't know if you ever met, met, met Tom Cruise. But. Uh, Mayor Johnson, let's, uh, we're eager also to hear about uh, the development of your values uh, as well. So can you say a little bit about uh, your upbringing and, and experiences or people in your life that uh, instilled in you uh, the values that, that then le led you to be committed to, uh, to government service and to public education as well? Yeah, I grew up in the uh, Oak Park community, not too far from here. And uh, I'm a product of public schools. I went to one elementary school, one middle school, one high school, and one public university. And what I had in my neighborhood in Oak Park that other kids did not have was a stability of a family environment. I lost my dad um, when I was three years old. He had drowned in the river. And my mom was a single parent. <coughs> but, my, but my grandparents uh, immediately stepped in. So I was the beneficiary of three parents. I had a mom, a grandmother, and a grandfather in the Oak Park community. And my grandfather was a sheet metal worker and very blue collar, strong work ethic, very structured. But the thing that I remember most about my grandfather was just this commitment of helping out in the community, being a good neighbor, making a difference uh, in the community. My grandmother on the other side was very gracious and she was a person that always made sure I did thank you notes when you got a gift. And if I didn't do it, I'd have to sit at the table and couldn't eat or go out and play. So just the giving to the community and also being thankful and appreciating what you get um, were two very strong uh, influences for me as a young person. Um, I got a scholarship from Sacramento High School to UC Berkeley. And this is where Michelle and I differ a little bit. She went to private schools the majority of her life. I got to college, she was, she was overprepared. And I got to college and for the first time I realized I was underprepared that I did not get a good education growing up, where I thought I did. I got A's and B's the whole time. I actually skipped fifth grade. So, I mean, how much smarter can you be than that? You skipped it. I skipped a whole grade, so. Did you skip a grade? Look, I have to tell this story. We, okay, wait, wait. Here, here's how this relationship works. We, we had a, 
had a, we had a, somebody threw an engagement party for us, and at the engagement party, they uh, they found t sort of tidbits about each of us. So they would read the tidbit, and then <laughs> the, the crowd would have to guess was it him or me. And so the one when they got to the, this one, they said skip the fifth grade, and everyone yelled Michelle, <laughs> and he was like, no, it was me. <laughs> So when I got to UC Berkeley, uh, I was in a freshman English class, and I remember uh, the teacher, the professor, asking these students a question. And the question was, you know, to the students, can you describe a euphemism? And there were 30 kids in the class, and all 29 all knew exactly what a euphemism was. And I was like, <laughs> so I'm looking at my little course schedule, and I'm like, am I in the right class? And it was, <laughs> Frog English, you know, beginning. <coughs> and I didn't know what a euphemism was. And I realized at that point in time that I did not get the quality education that a lot of other people got up and down the state of California. And I made a commitment that if I was ever successful enough, I was going to go back to my community that I grew up in and not only make sure that kids knew what euphemism meant, but made sure that they had access to really good schools. And that's really what kind of brought us together, this commitment of trying to eradicate the inequalities that often occur in, in public education. And when I got into the MBA, um, my first year in the league, I knew I wanted to come back to Sacramento and, and do something in my neighborhood. And I figured I'd start an after school program called St. Hope, committed to you know, just education for young people in our community. And the reason why I started it is during the summer of my freshman, my senior year of college and my first year in the MBA, I realized when I went back to my community, all my friends were in jail, on drugs, or dead. And those who weren't dead had kids. And you can see the cycle just starting to repeat itself over and over. So my whole commitment, and this is in fact why I ran for mayor, is I wanted to d disrupt this cycle and to make sure that kids in underserved communities have access to really good schools and do know what the word euphemism means. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that's a great story, very interesting. Uh, the two of you have very similar commitments and very similar values, but from radically different uh, beginnings. So, and, and, and uh, Kevin, your, your comments about public education resonate with me as well, because I'm a, pu I'm a product of public education. I went to public schools all the way up to, to college and uh, had a great experience there. And uh, so it's really a worthy, worthy commitment. You know, what, one of the things that, that I think is so interesting about tonight and about having Kevin and Michelle here is the, the individual stories that they have uh, and all they've accomplished uh, individually yet separately, but also the, the dynamic and the chemistry between them, which we've already seen a little bit of. And um, uh, let, let me then move on to the, my next question, and that is, um, how do the two of you help each other be better leaders? Okay, so I, the, the motivation behind this is that uh, uh, my wife is a professional person as well and, uh, and, and an Asian woman, so I'm kind of partial. So, um, and she helps me a lot, actually, in, in, in my work, and, uh, and I help her. And I'm just curious about the conversations that the two of you have about different leadership or organizational change uh, issues that you might be uh, confronting because in, in, in each other, you have an, an amazing coach to help each other in these. So, Michelle, what, what, what observations have you had in the way that the, the two of you have helped each other? Um, I think that one, one way that we are very different and one way that, what, that the mayor's helped me tremendously is I am very impatient and I, I don't like uncertainty. And so my personality is such that when I'm faced with a situation, I want to make a decision very quickly, and I want to move and then be done with it, and then you know move on to the next thing. So very, um, you know, one step after the other. And one of the things I think that he's helped me with is is being okay with uncertainty a little bit more and taking a little bit more time in making decisions. And it's not a it's a not a natural thing for me. It makes me feel uncomfortable. But it, uh, I've had a, a number of situations where, it, you know, he sort of said, okay, let's just wait a second and think for a little while. Hmm. And, you know, I'm sitting here like this, twitching, and, uh, and, and it turns out that the next day or the day after, something will come to one of us that 
we never would have thought of, you know, at that moment that, that has allowed me to make a better decision and have a better outcome overall. And so that, that has been extraordinarily helpful to me. Hmm. Interesting. Kevin? <laughs> uh, let's see. I think that, you know, we really complement each other in many respects, but it is pretty neat to be able to come home and at the end of the night, you come together talking about what you both are so passionate about, which is education. So when she downloads her day, it's, it's about a topic I care a great deal about. And when I'm talking about my day, it's usually about a topic she cares a great deal about, as long as I'm not talking about council meetings. Um, but I think where, where, where she's been probably most helpful for me are, are two, two concrete things. We met in Washington, D.C. at a Teach for America conference. It was a 10-year, 15-year anniversary. And we ended up having a relationship. She ended up sitting on my board in Sacramento uh, for St. Hope. And I think most of you know the work and the success that we've had at Sac High and PS7, but she was a board member. And she came in and she brought people to our board from around the country that would have not otherwise come to Sacramento. So her ability to attract talent and get people to buy into the mission that we had in Oak Park um, was, was very helpful. And then the second thing, which is a little bit funnier, uh -oh. she's saying, you heard her say that she's impatient, and I always get accused of being really impatient in Sacramento. But <laughs> there's times I interview people, and I say, that's a really nice person. They should make the next round. And she's like, no, got to go. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, well, what do you mean? Are you, are you trying to hire a nice person or you want somebody who's going to get results, is what she says. And I'm like, I want a nice person who can get results. <laughs> that nice person is not going to get you results. So the, the point of it is she has a really high bar on talent. And it gets into your organizational theme of change. It's really about attracting leadership, human capital at a really high level. And because she travels around the country, she's very impatient in terms of bringing people on board that she does not think can deliver at a really high level. That's no different in a business. You, need, you bet on a management team. You bet on leadership. Um, that has been her strength for me and been one that has allowed me to uh, be a little bit more, um, what the right word is? You normally finish discerning. my sentences. Discerning being a little more discerning in terms of who we bring on board. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a great transition to another question I wanted to ask, and that was really about um, human capital decisions, uh, choosing colleagues, team members, uh, other leaders, uh, and with an eye toward uh, people who are going to be your allies in uh, advancing the mission of your organization and advancing organizational change uh, activities and, and efforts. So, let, so Michelle, can we, can we explore a little bit more deeply? So it sounds like you, you are very intuitive and you uh, have, uh, are, are able to draw uh, judgments in, in, a, in a very efficient way. Are you, are you able to reflect on how it is that you do that and what are the criteria that you tend to look at when you're making decisions about bringing someone on board? So first you should know that over the 20 years of my career, I've probably you know, recruited, meaning hired and fired more people than most people ever will in a lifetime. That was what I, I did. My job was, was hiring people because my, I, I ran an organization called the New Teacher Project and what we did was hired uh -huh. thousands and thousands of people a year to teach in, in, in uh, uh, public school districts across the country. So this is sort of my thing. My staff used to make fun of me that I would have the seven minute interview. That I knew within seven minutes whether somebody was going to make it or not. And then they'd say, could you just please be nice for the last 23 minutes of the interview and not make the person feel like you, you, you knew exactly what was going to happen when they walked in the door. Um, I. I think some of it is intuitive, uh, but there are a couple of things that I look for in, in any position that I'm hiring for, from an office manager uh, all the way up through a, a president of a, an organization that I'm running, and that is 
Um, one that we, I need somebody who's very goal oriented, uh, somebody who is, who is, who measures their success based on measurable uh, goals and um, also someone who uh, can talk about how they have persevered through challenges to get on the other side. Mm -hmm. So in my business, nothing is easy. Uh, you're gonna have roadblocks everywhere and the extent to which a person can um, you know, work beyond those roadblocks and constantly be thinking about a different angle to take is incredibly uh, important. I think as a, as a leader, um, I have many, many faults and things that I'm not good at, um, but one of the things that I think I, I am good at and, and um, is, is sniffing out talent. And I, I always am looking to hire people underneath me who are a lot smarter than I am. Uh, and because my job is not to be the smartest person in the room, my job is to block and tackle for all of the smart people so that they can do incredible work. And so one of the things I, I always pride myself on is, is finding people who are unbelievably talented uh, and, and assembling a great team and then knocking down all the barriers so they can do their jobs. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's great. Uh, those are fascinating reflections and it resonates with me because I think my job is to ensure that other people can do their jobs and flourish in their jobs. <laughs> so uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. So, um, Kevin, what, what about your thoughts when, when you're, we already talked a little bit about how you see things differently, but um, what are your thoughts and what are your criteria when you think about bringing someone uh, on board your, uh, your team and your organization? And is there anything specific about uh, uh, being in government service that, say, differs from what Michelle does in her work in public education? or are things really more generic and there are more commonalities across those? I think there's situations. a lot of commonalities and I think, you know, again, for me, thinking about our discussion today, you know, I want to think about like what are my core beliefs and my core values and, and my, my four or five are, one, um, I believe that every kid is special. I don't care who it is. That's a core belief I have. Mm -hmm. uh, another one would believe, be um, I have a, a, a tremendous you know, a goal to really focus on results, so very result-oriented. Mm -hmm. um, another one would be uh, relentless pursuit of excellence, uh, you know, just that commitment of excellence. Another, I'm a fanatic uh, about details. You know, things need to be done uh, a certain way, and that's really important um, to me. So when I think about hiring people, I want people that embrace those core values. Mm -hmm. And because I played sports in my other life, um, I want somebody who's competitive. I want somebody who's got great energy and is very competitive. They know what the goal is. They know how to play and be a part of a team. And they want to be held accountable for what outcomes, whatever those are. And when you think about, you know, in, in business school, you have, you know, the three, you know, the triangle of success. You have relationships, results, and process. Mm -hmm. I can give a... Um, what? Diagram. Who? A diagram. I don't care a whole lot about process. Oh. <laughs> so I'm really focused on results. But as an elected official, relationships mm -hmm. is so important. Right. So I've had to learn to, you know, is, is temper my commitment for results or at least find a way to make that compatible mm -hmm. with this, this notion of relationships um, to get to where we need to be. So at the end of the day, you know, I think my job is to articulate a shared vision and then have people who believe in those goals, deeply invest in those goals, can take a plan, execute it, and are gonna constantly reassess on whether or not we're getting there. But it's really about accountability. If people don't wanna be held accountable, it's just not gonna work. You know, we're not ones where we don't make excuses for what we do. If it works out, you know, you pat, you pat each other on the back and you give somebody else credit. And if it doesn't work out, you say, I didn't do my job well enough. And that's the kind of people you wanna work with on a regular basis. He, he is much more of an optimist. He, 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 he does, he, he, he has this incredible belief in people. Uh, that he, he wants to believe the best in people. And so it's interesting because we'll have you know, conversations all the time where somebody will have messed up however many times and then they'll come to him and have this big story about how 
going forward, it's going to be different. And he'll come out and say, OK, yes. And I'm like, are you kidding, honey? Because for me, it's sort of, you know, you cut your losses and, and you, you move on. And, uh, you know, for him, he just wants to believe that what that person is saying is really going to turn everything around. Um, but that's one of the things that, that I, I actually appreciate most about him. He, he is such an optimist. He, he, such, he so sort of believes in, in people's desire to want to do well that he kind of wants to create an environment where, you know, everyone can be successful, too. Steve, tell her what your mom said about you growing up being liked. <laughs> this is funny. So, <laughs> <coughs> my first year on the job in D.C., uh, in the first 100 days, we decided to close 23 schools. And it was um, lit literally, I mean, if you want to become the most unpopular person in a city really quickly, all you have to do is say you're closing a school, much less 23. It had never been done at that scale before. And uh, so, uh, you know, we announced we were going to do this, and, and the city went ballistic. And uh, so my mother was there during, during all of this. And, uh, you know, one day she sort of, you know, wakes up and she opens the newspaper. There's a two-page two spread with a map of the city pinpointing all of the schools that I was closing. She turns on the uh, TV and, you know, there are people picketing outside of my office and, you know, yelling and screaming at me. And so I came home that night after all these community meetings at 11 o'clock at night. She's like, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. She said, you know, it's so interesting. When you were young, you never cared what other people thought about you. And I always thought that you were going to grow up to be antisocial. <laughs> she said, I see now that this is serving you well. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that, that's just a little insight into the way that my particular brain works. I guess I've always been that way, though. <laughs> fascinating, fascinating. So one of the topics that uh, I'm, I'm personally interested in in, in my research is uh, the role of trust in the workplace and trust in leaders. So um, what, what are your reflections uh, on how to build trust, how to maintain trust, uh, how to repair trust if, rep if, if trust is, is, is damaged? So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about that, Michelle? So um, my, my good friends and I have a saying, we always say to each other, trust is the basis of any relationship. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. You have, you have to have faith and trust. Uh, it, it, it was interesting because as I was working uh, in, in the job uh, in DC, oftentimes people would um, you know, come and say, well, you know, we don't believe in you, we don't believe that you're, you know, you want the right things, X, Y, and Z, and I said, great, you know what, you should probably go somewhere else and work then, because I don't think that anyone ever wants to be in a position where they are working for someone that they don't have full faith mm -hmm. and confidence and trust in. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree with everything that the person you know, agrees with or, or, or believes or anything like that, but you fundamentally have to trust folks uh, and, and believe in, in the people that you're working for. Um, I, I think that in DC, one of the, uh, we, we sort of fell into this trap of um, uh, underestimating the power that the media had in what we were doing every day. So we were operating, we sort of put our noses down, we sort of thought, okay, if we we are doing the right things and, and producing results, then people will you know, see those results and like them and want more. But what we underestimated was the fact that there, was, uh, there were sort of these stories that would come up in the media all of the time. And you know, they, would, they were often sort of about the conflict and the controversy and, and that sort of thing. And we used to read those things like, oh, no one's, no one's really going to believe that. Um, and, and we didn't do a good job of actually sending out any kind of different messages. Mm -hmm. So then the messages that the sort of media was creating or the mm -hmm. dynamics that they were creating were the ones that stuck mm -hmm. in people's heads. And that was, that was a shortcoming on our side and my side as a, as a leader because I was sort of, we kind of abdicated responsibility of the communications uh, to, to the media and we did not proactively go out 
and communicate with our employees on a regular basis to say, actually, that's not what the story, this is, this is what we're trying to do, and this is why we're doing the things that we're doing. And repeating that message over and over again, we, we very much underestimated just the, the, the power of that communication or the lack thereof. And so, um, you know, whenever people ask me, well, you know, what, what would you do again, or what advice would you give to people who are trying to do what you're trying to do, uh, you know, my biggest piece of advice is, is that the, when, when you're talking about the kinds of change that we were trying to enable uh, in, the, in the district, which was really transformational change, it was a sea change, that it, it, you, you have to have very clear, very consistent and constant communication out about what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it, and what you're hoping to accomplish through those actions. Mm. Mayor? Yeah, I'll, I'll just build on what she's saying. When you think about how many students in here are part of the MBA program here at UC Davis? So you guys, are, you guys are all reading about this or you read about it. I mean, there's different kind of leaders, and I feel like I'm more into the transformational leader category. That's kind of my mentality, the aspiration, the vision, and taking on a challenge. And part of it is you have to attract people that also want that environment. It's a little more entrepreneurial, high risk, high reward. Um, that's not for everybody. So now that I'm in the public sector environment, it's the opposite of that. You know, it's, it's process, it's about consensus, it's about uh, let's plan the plan and then plan a little more and then talk about the plan and then <laughs> put the plan on a shelf and then start all over and then there's a new election cycle and then you pull a plan off and, you know, and that's just a different environment when you want results. And so when I think about my work as an athlete, first of all, and I'll give two, as an athlete, when you play good team defense, you cannot in the NBA guard a player by yourself. They're just too good. You rely on your teammate to help you. So you commit to a system. If I force a guy left, my teammate is going to help out. That's a commitment that you have to have, which gets to trust. You can't do it as a single person. Mm -hmm. So if you fast forward to the school environment, going back to being a transformational leader, if you lay out on the front end what you expect and what you're trying to do, that will attract people and they want to do that. And it's very clear on the front end. So let me give you an example. If we say we're willing to take on the status quo and we're going to start a new organization uh, from the ground up, if you don't have an entrepreneurial spirit, if you don't realize that every day is going to be a little different, it's not predictive, um, if you want a stable environment, then that's not the right environment for you. So when we, when we lay out for teachers, thinking about just commitment of trust, we tell teachers that you're not going to be a normal teacher in this environment. You have to be more than a teacher because when you're in an underserved community, you're gonna have to work longer hours, you're gonna have longer school days, you're gonna have to take your cell home at night. Now, if you don't wanna do that, then this is not the school for you. Mm -hmm. Most teachers say they wanna do it, and some do it for about two weeks and they're like, I don't wanna do this. But at least we were forthright and very clear on what the expectation was in the very beginning. What that does though, it starts to create an environment that people feel like you have been in the trenches together because you're doing more, you're working harder, you're challenged, your mountain is steeper. That attracts a certain mindset of people and I think when you're a transformational leader, those are the people and the challenges that you want and that trust um, is critically important to accomplish anything. So whether you're playing sports, whether you're in running schools like we have done in the past, or even in the public sector, I'm still trying to figure out how to do it there. I haven't quite figured it out yet, but we're working on it. I'm, I'm interested in how the two of you have dealt with the inertia of the organizations in which you run, uh, in, in which you operate. So, um, Kevin, you were just talking about the bigger focus on process in, in, in government. So, how do you, and, and Michelle, you were talking about the influence of the media and, and how that was very strong and somewhat relentless. So, how, how do you avoid um, those forces sort of rubbing the edges off of you in a, in a negative way, where you start to lose your energy, where you start to lose your, your commitment? And, and do you ever, do you, do you consciously have to think about resisting those, those forces that sort of sap you from your, sap your energy and your commitment? 
and your entrepreneurial focus from you? Let me, let me give the context and then you can feel free to answer the question. Is that okay? I gotta get permission. So, <coughs> Dean, we were in Aspen, Colorado together um, a month after we met. And you had the top reformers at the Aspen Institute, 40 of them in a room. And we all were on the outside of the public sector. We ran nonprofits and different organizations. You had Arnie Duncan at the time who was in charge of, uh, you know, schools in, in Chicago before he became Secretary of Education. Mm -hmm. Cory Booker was a council member, the founder of Teach for America, the founder of KIPP Schools. We're all in the room, and these are the top reformers in the country. And we met for three days, and we talked about how we're going to change the world. And at the end of three days, it became very clear that we were just going to go back to our respective communities and keep doing what we were doing, but not really change the world. Mm. And, and I remember I got a chance to make a closing comment. And my closing comment was, if people in this room really want to make a change, we should do two things. One of us should go back and become a superintendent or a chancellor inside the system. Because you've got to take the things you do in the private sector that work and take the, this system can't change itself from within. You needed to take folks on the outside and put them inside. So that was a chancellor or a superintendent. And somebody else needed to go back and become a mayor of their city. The irony of that discussion, she and I were the ones that did, did that. She went and became a chancellor in DC and I became a mayor and I think she can get out a little bit of why we think that's important, especially in terms of consensus, which I'll let you kind of throw out here. Um, you know, when I, when I uh, started my job in D.C. about probably, I don't know, five or six weeks in, uh, I remember I was driving home one night, it was raining, and uh, my cell phone rang, and I, I looked at my phone, and it was a call from Joel Klein, who was the <laughs> chancellor of the New York City Public Schools at the time, and he was the one who had... Uh, uh, referred me to the mayor of DC, so he, he sort of gotten me into the whole uh, job to begin with. So I pulled over to the side of the road and I pick up the phone, and he says, uh, "Okay, Michelle, I am going to give you two pieces of advice." I said, "Okay, let her rip." And the first thing he said, he says, "So first of all, do you have a boyfriend?" <laughs> and I said, "No, well, I don't. At the time, I didn't." And he said, "Okay, uh, so my first piece of advice is go out and get one." <laughs> and I said, sir, and he said, because let me just tell you that this job is the loneliest job you could possibly imagine. Mm. And unless you have someone at home every night that you come, uh, come home to at the end of the night who says to you, honey, you're not the crazy one. They're the crazy ones. <laughs> you're just fine. He said, unless you have that kind of emotional support every night when you go home, you're never going to make it. So go get yourself a dating life. That was the first <laughs> thing that he said. And uh, I never thought in my entire life that I would be getting love life advice from Joel Klein, but there I was. And <laughs> so I, after that, I said, okay, so what's the second piece of advice? And he said, the second piece of advice is you have to lead from the front. And he said it in such a definitive way that I said, okay, thank you, sir. And I hung up the phone and I get back on the road and I'm like, I have no idea what that means. I had no <laughs> idea what that guy's talking about. And it wasn't actually until a few months later that I was going through the whole school closure process where literally people would be picketing outside of my office every day, everyone on the TV, radio, you name it, was sort of criticizing me. And, uh, and I realized that, that uh, you know, this is, this is what he was talking about because um, a, a year after uh, all the school closures were done, a woman came up to me uh, at a community meeting and she, she said, do you remember me? Look. She said, I was the one that was always yelling at you all the time with the school closures. You and said, I, which one? Yeah, I, which said, I, was, I was like, oh, no, I remember you. And she said, I just wanted you to know that you were right. I couldn't see it at the time because it was such an emotional process and we didn't want the school to close. But you, you were right. You, I'm in, we're in a better school now. We have more resources. The kids are getting a better education. So good job. And I thought, OK. See, so. I, I realize that leading from the front means that if you get mired in, in, in sort of the, you know, trying to make everybody happy all of the time and trying to keep the noise levels to a minimum, the likelihood that you're actually going to move anything is not high. Sometimes you have to be able to see things that other people can't see maybe at that point, but you know it's the right thing to do. You have to get out in front 
and you have to lead people to that, and eventually, if you're, doing, you're making the decisions for the right reasons, then people will come along to that. Um, and, and so, you know, I think in, in, any, in any situation where you're, you're trying to really crack open uh, things that, that have been in place for a long, long time, change doesn't come easy. It's, it, you know, as much as people say they want change, it's only until you actually start to change their lives and they're like, wait, 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 not so much. Um, and so, you know, when you're in the middle of that, realizing that there's something on the other side um, and, and kind of keeping your, your core of what you know is good and right um, is, is important. I think you have to, you remember your two speech that you wanted to give <laughs> about consensus? Yeah. Tell, tell him that one real quick. See, he's going to get me in trouble. You're in Sacramento. <laughs> it's better you get in trouble than me. <laughs> so he's, he, he, it was, I was, uh, after my first year on the job, uh, for, for one year I sort of had given my, my standard stump speech, and, um, and I was heading into year two of the job, and I, was, I sort of thought, okay, well, I have to change up my speech. I can't give the, can continue to give the same speech over and over again. He said, so well, just think about your first year and what your, you know, your biggest lessons were, and, and then just you know, give a speech about that. And so I was trying to think about, okay, what, what are my biggest lessons learned? And, and the sort of first thing that came to my head was <laughs> consensus and collaboration, cooperation is overrated. <laughs> so I uh, decided to try it out, and I, I gave my first speech of the second year, and I was like, consensus, collaboration, and cooperation are overrated. And then that was all that was in the media the next day. <laughs> Recess, collaboration, overrated. But, but what, I, what I actually meant by that was that in, in, in the public schools, collaboration became the end game. Right? So what, what mm -hmm. everybody became focused on was mm -hmm. how can we all get along mm -hmm. and all the, keep all the adults happy? Mm -hmm. And it was this, it, it created this environment where literally, when I, when I started in D.C. in 2007, 8% of our 8th graders in the city schools were on grade level in mathematics. 8%. If you were to have looked at the performance evaluations of the adults in the system at the same time, you'd have seen that 95% of the adults were being rated as doing an excellent job. How can you have a system where all of the adults are running around thinking they're doing great work when what we're producing for kids is 8% success? Mm -hmm. And it was because the culture and the environment was such that we all wanted to feel good about ourselves. We wanted to pat each other on the back. Aren't we doing a good job, right? And so it was so, totally about process. Yeah, so totally. all of the adults were happy with the system, even though it was completely failing kids. And that's, that, that was my point, was that you know, we can all get along. And, and in my mind, we, we, for far too long in public education, have been willing to turn a blind eye to what is happening every day to children in classrooms in the name of harmony amongst adults. Mm -hmm. And that has to stop. We have to be OK with adults feeling a little uncomfortable with things so that we can actually change the system and provide kids with what they deserve. So just to add on to that, we, we know from research literature that there is a, a, functional, a functional amount of conflict. You can either have too little conflict, which is the situation you're describing, or too much, of course, and either one is, is, is pathological to the organization. So it's very interesting to, to hear your experience. Uh, Kevin, your, your thoughts, uh, further thoughts on, you're, you're obviously a very energetic entrepreneurial mayor, but there are pressures that must come to bear that, that, that make it more difficult on you to retain that energy and that spirit. So are you mindful of those, and do you have a uh, mechanism for resisting that kind of pressure? Yeah, I mean, again, thinking about your audience, especially the students that are in business school, if you get involved in public sector, it's just different rules of the game. It's not the same that you would do in the private sector. You don't have the ability to be super entrepreneurial, make a decision and go for it, and look at the bottom line. It's about process, it's about relationships, it's about how many people did you talk to. It's often about making somebody else feel like it's their idea. Mm. Um, so they can own it and feel good about it. And that's just not something that I was used to. It was like, you know, I played team sports. The goal is to make everybody around you better, but you want to win. Mm. Um, one simple example, this is how simple basketball was. In the NBA, when I played for the Phoenix Suns, we had, our goal at the beginning of the season was just this. 
win 15 playoff games. That was it. Does that mean you're champs if you win Absolutely. <laughs> okay. It's just that simple. If you win 15 playoff games, that's all you need. So everything we did in training camp, in preseason, in November and December was all working toward mm -hmm. a playoff where you need to win the 15 games. If you won three in the first round, four in the second, four and four, that would make you an NBA champ. Mm -hmm. So when you had conflict amongst your teammates or people who mm -hmm. didn't want to go along with the program, our coach would say, is that going to help us win 15 games mm -hmm. in the playoffs? Right. And at that point, you realize everything else doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Well, in the public sector, it doesn't, to her point, it's not even about results half the time. That's been the most frustrating mm -hmm. part. You know, I ran for mayor because I want Sacramento to be a cool city. I want it to reach its potential. I want its streets to be safe and good schools and create jobs and all those things that we believe so strongly in. The results at the end of the day are not what drive the decisions that we make in the city of Sacramento. And that was, to me, probably the most mm -hmm. profound lesson I've learned in the two years that I've been mayor. Yeah. You know, I, I warned him of this. When, when, <laughs> when, when he told me he was thinking about running for mayor, this was before we were started to see each other and, and we were just friends, and he said, I'm thinking about doing this. And I said, are you crazy? This is, this is so not what you want to do, given your personality, because he's very results-oriented. He, he wants to just make a decision and, and, and have it you know, carried out and then go. And uh, that's not how government works. And so when he first told me that he wanted to do this, I thought there's, there's, there's nothing, no job that is sort of a worse fit for, for your personality than, than, than that. Um, but she was I, right. But I, no, but I tell you, like, what, what drives him so much is he loves this city. He loves Sacramento. I mean, you know, he, he'll tell you the stories about how, you know, people teased him all the time when they'd come to Sacramento in the NBA, the, it was one of the worst cities to go to and all. He loves Sacramento. He wants the city to reach its potential, and so that's where he gets his energy every day. I mean, r despite the fact that he's not able to necessarily do all of the things that he wants to do on the time frame that he wants to do it on, he, 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 his energy is sort of endless for wanting to just, you know, make the city the best it can be. So he has a very clear superordinate goal that dominates his behavior and his actions, even if the organization in which he operates does not have a single superordinate goal. And in my job in year two and three now is to try to figure out how to get eight <laughs> other council members to participate in this shared vision mm -hmm. with key priorities, with performance matrix that lead to results that are more important. And we're making progress, but that's just not what I expected. I thought it would be an entirely different, but I was clearly wrong. And once again, she was right, but. <laughs> So um, um, I'll ask one last question, and then we'll invite you all to ask your questions or make your comments. But I'm, I'm interested in, as, as Michelle, as you look at uh, reforming public education and public school districts, and, and Kevin, as you think about our region and trying to take it forward, and you, and you both think about organizational change, how do you decide what to change and what to leave alone? because you can't change everything. Some things you have to leave in place. And how do you differentiate between what has to be left in place versus what to go after and really uh, allocate your, your time and effort to? So which, how do you decide which levers to pull and which to leave alone? That's a good question, I, when I, and, and one that we faced when, when I took over the school system in D.C. because everything was broken. Literally everything needed to be fixed. And so the question was, wh what, what do you do and, and how and when? And for m me, the sort of primary um, uh, thinking that we went through is, okay, there's an order of operation. So, for example, lots of people would say to me, well, how come you never tried to lengthen the school day. Why, you were so focused on teacher quality you know, and, and making sure that, mm -hmm. the, that you had the right teachers and principals in place. Why didn't you, why didn't you try to extend the, the amount of time that kids were in school? And I would say, well, because you, you, you have to make sure that what's happening in the classroom is good first, because more crappy teaching is not going to help any kids, <laughs> right? So you have to make sure you've got the right people doing the right things mm -hmm. in the classroom first, and then more of that 
is going to have a benefit. But if you if you try to pull the wrong levers, mm -hmm. you know, or, or th in the in the wrong order, it's it's actually not going to produce the results that you need. And so part of what we had to think through was what was that what's that order of operation? Um, and and I think that's you know when you're talking about systems that are as as you know wholly dysfunctional as the one that we saw, it was a it was a it was a careful balance between seeing you know as much change as you wanted to on a quick enough time frame but not you know disrupting the entire system so that people couldn't actually operate or didn't know uh, you know what what was what was happening or what was expected of them very very interesting to, to uh, hear that and see a parallel between what you just described and what I face in leading a business school because people often ask me these questions, well, where, where do you intervene? What do you focus on first? What are your priorities? And, and the answer is the faculty. So uh, to the extent that I can continue to build great faculty in the Graduate School of Management, uh, a lot of other things follow from that. So there's many things we can foc focus on in terms of admissions and student placement and alumni relations. All those things are important, but there is, in, at least in my mind, a, a, a hierarchy of where am I going, if, if I allocate my effort, this is where I'm getting the most bang for the buck. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to, to, to focus on faculty quality, and just uh, recently we were ranked number three in the world in faculty quality by The Economist magazine. So, um, so we've, uh, we've, we've been very successful over the years in hiring uh, and developing great faculty. So, um, Kevin, what, what are your thoughts in terms of how you prioritize? What do you, what do you go after versus what do you leave alone in terms of effectuating change? I think looking at it from a regional standpoint, I think was, was partly your question. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my challenges, I would go back to Washington, I would hear where the president would want to go and where his agenda was, and I'd come back and I'd realize that no one in our region heard it. So one of the things I had to do in year two is bring more people out so they can hear. Mm -hmm. It's like going on a field trip, exposure, getting experience, so that when I started talking about a vision or where we would go, people would say, yes, I heard it. I see where we're trying to go. So when President Obama said that during this economic you know, challenges that we're having, if you want stimulus dollars in your community, those communities that work together as a region mm -hmm. are going to get more dollars. Well, when I was able to come back and then bring people out and then they heard it, it made sense for our, re it was in our self-interest as a region to create a regional economy, to collaborate as a region. And then you come up with a couple proof points that our region understands that will be much better and much stronger working as a region. Um, that was something that was easy to do um, after the president said it. The other point was I realized that Sacramento, when you think about our region, we're looked at as the bully because we're the big capital city and whatever we do in Sacramento, we usually do it without respect to the other cities. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I had to do early on is go out to, mm -hmm. whether it be Woodland or Winters or Yuba mm -hmm. or Roseville, go out to those communities and say, you know, I don't have the answer. What's important to you and how can we work together? So I'm doing all the things that Michelle says she's not a big fan of, which is <laughs> consensus, and cooperation and collaboration. I realized that in this public sector, it just will not work without doing those type of things. So you've got to find a balance. That's been my challenge. But it's also been very rewarding. You know, my, my personality is more executive. I want to make a decision and get something done. You've got to be legislative as well, uh, especially in our governance structure, the one we have. And I think as a region, we've made a lot of strides, you know, with your help and the GreenWise initiative. If we look at Davis as being a separate city on the other side of the causeway, our region loses. But if we look at the Sacramento region to include Davis and El Dorado and Roseville and Elk Grove, we are so much stronger um, when we fight um, as a region. And I think you've seen a lot of that progress um, in the last couple of years because we've, there's not one initiative that I've done in the last two years that has not been a regional initiative. And I think council members and mayors in some smaller cities have appreciated that because they've been able to contribute in a real way. No, I think you've been very successful at that, actually. And I've, I've heard you uh, repeat that theme over and over again. We certainly saw that in GreenWise because uh, you reached out to the entire region and we did feel like it was, it was a broader regional uh, effort. And I, I think that's a very wise tactical thing to do because you, you're in a situation where you have very little 
you, you cannot rely on hierarchy in the way that you deal with Roseville. I mean, you, you don't really have any authority or jurisdiction over them. You have to use influence and, and, and pull them along and help, and as you were saying before, bring people, say, to Washington to help them catch the vision, to educate them about the vision to, to order to try to, to, to get people to converge with you on, on that vision. So I, I think you've done that incredibly well, and I think it's been received very well by the entire region. Dean, can I say one thing for your, your students here? I think it's important. So as much as I'm trying to collaborate, cooperate, and create consensus, at the end of the day, sometimes you do still have to put your foot down. So let me give you an example. The GreenWise initiative was called GreenWise Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And people around the region didn't want to call it Sacramento. So then I had to put on my other hat at that point and, 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 and get people to understand that you may not like it, but this is the Sacramento region. And if you want to go back to Washington, if we have a no-name region, mm. it's not going to mean a whole lot to folks. Mm. But if our region is the capital of California, it would serve us well. So in that room full of, say, 50 people, we might have had two-thirds of the people supportive mm -hmm. and a third not, and that was okay. So I guess to the students out here, you're not always going to get everybody exactly where you want, but at least if it's founded in being fair and listening and rationale that, and logic that people can appreciate, um, that's still enough. You know, sometimes a majority plus one is, is enough to get things done. Well, that's the balance, the balance between uh, cooperating and partnering and those things. But at some point, decisions have to be made, and you have to exert leadership. Okay, so I hope you've been uh, thinking about your questions during this very interesting uh, dialogue that we've had. So um, can I invite you to go to the microphone, please, and to identify yourself, um, and uh, let's hear your question. Rick, would you like to start us? There's a green light. That looks encouraging. Okay. Um, my question is for... Can you identify yourself, uh, please? Yes. I'm Rick Fowler, president of the Community College Foundation, and uh, thanks to the good graces of Dean Harold Levine, chair of the UC Davis School of Education Advisory Board. Uh, yesterday, I was at the Los Angeles uh, Unified School District and was told that they had a $400 million budget cut next year and would be laying off 7,000 people. And it, in light of the comments that I've heard tonight, I was thinking about uh, asking Chancellor Ree if she feels that the governance model of a school district that has evolved so differently in so many different places is up to the challenges of what has to be done today. Thank you. So the quick answer is no. I think that uh, when you are talking about systems that are as low performing and as dysfunctional as a Washington DC or an LA Unified, uh, a school board structure is not gonna work. You have nine different people with nine different agendas, all who you know, have their own local elections to worry about, many of whom are using that as sort of a stepping stone into greater office, et cetera, who are you know, together trying to make decisions about policy doesn't make any sense whatsoever and, and is not going to get you at the end of the day to where you need to go. Uh, I'm a huge believer in mayoral control uh, of, of low performing school districts. I think that you've got to at, at the end of the day have one person who's ultimately accountable for what happens or doesn't happen in the district and without an executive, you know, to the Dean's point, whose who's, you know, job is on the line, who's going to make those decisions, I don't, don't think that uh, you can get anywhere and, and the situation that you're describing is, is a situation that every school district across the country will be facing in the next few months, which is that there's the, an ongoing budget crisis, uh, there are jobs that are going to be cut, um, and the way that we lay off teachers in this country is absolutely insane. We, we utilize a policy called LIFO, last in, first out, mm -hmm. which means that the last person hired is the first person fired regardless of how good they are or aren't. So those decisions are made with no regard to how good the person is in the classroom. And this has three incredibly negative impacts on kids. One, 
the research shows that you end up firing some of the most highly effective teachers in the district. I mean, it, that makes no sense. The second is that you end up having to lose more jobs because the, the j most junior teachers are paid the least amount of money, so in order to close the budget deficit, you actually have to fire more people, lose more jobs. And the third is that it disproportionately negatively impacts the lowest performing schools. Because the, the higher performing schools in affluent areas of the city, that's where everybody wants to go, and once you get a job there, you stay there forever. So they have very few new teachers. Whereas the, 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 the schools in, in, in the inner city, in, in Watts, for example, have 50% of their staff are new teachers, and those schools are decimated by the budget cuts, and the affluent schools are untouched. It's ab and the, the, this policy makes absolutely no sense for children or for schools. But for decades, this is how we have been doing business. Because the, you, know, you essentially have a situation right now where you, you have management, right, the school board, who are usually uh, elected through, through the support of union dollars. So that you have union on both sides of the bargaining table, right? That, that, that is never going to get you a contract that is, that is going to put kids first and foremost. And I think that if we want to change the policies to be focused on what is best for children, you have to change that dynamic. So is, 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 is your recommendation then that uh, the composition of school boards is the problem, or is it the way that they get elected? So uh, separate those for us. Help us understand. So if you, if you were to change the governance system, how, how would you do it? Well, I don't think that, that you could run the, the business school by committee, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that's the bottom line. I think that it, anyone knows this as an organization, in order to have a functional organization, not that you're not going to get input, not that you're not going to get lots of insights from different people, but at the end of the day, you have to have one boss, one decision maker. And, and the superintendent does not fulfill that role? <coughs> no. No, no, no. The superintendent <laughs> in, 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 a, in a school board run uh, district, the superintendent will tell you, if they're being honest, that they spend 60 to 70 percent of their time just trying to play politics amongst their school board. See, you know, if they want to uh, uh, imp implement a new policy, they're trying to figure out how they're going to get five votes and they're jockeying, and they're tr horse trading, and this sort of thing. In, in the mayoral control system, when I wanted to implement a new I initiative, I'd go to the mayor and say, sir, this is what we're going to do. And he'd say, great. It was very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Paul okay. Shanae, superintendent, uh, Wasco Union School District. Only 60 percent, huh? <laughs> uh, my question is, and it, it um, when you go into a new school district, and as you, as you alluded to, you only had to answer to the mayor, and you go into a system that has an existing culture, and as Mayor Johnson said, that if you don't want to work here, move on, what do you, how, do you, how do you go about changing that culture uh, to high expectations when the teachers that are working in that district are servicing a completely different set of kids than maybe they did when they worked there or started 25, 30 years ago? How so do you do that? I, I love this question, and this is, you have like teed her up on this question. I mean, this is what she makes a living doing is trying to figure out how to make sure the high expectations that she has or that we have for all children, that is consistent with teachers. And when they don't kind of agree and sign up on that, she is very effective at figuring out ways to help them find a different route. New career opportunities. Absolutely. Under, under the existing constraints that we have in California uh, with uh, uh, tenure and uh, layoff procedures. Yeah, that, that's a, it's a tough question. Um, I, one of the things that we did that we felt was very, very important in terms of beginning to change and shift the culture was to be very clear about the fact that we were going to measure results and measure progress. So the first thing I did when I, I came into the school district was I sat down with every individual principal and I said, what are you going to guarantee me in terms of results, achievement results in, in your school? And it was fascinating to me because a lot of the principals said, I've, I've never met the superintendent before. I've never been up on the ninth floor. And, um, and nobody's ever uh, you know, wanted me to, to say what my goals were. And I thought, it was just shocking to me that you, you know, how can you at the end of the school year, if you didn't see the results that you wanted to see as a school district or as a particular school, 
uh, get mad at anybody for not producing results if you didn't tell the people what your expectation was to begin with, if no one knew what the goal was. And so it was as simple for us as setting the goal school by school and having everybody know that that's what the expectation was. And then every time I would see one of those pr the t principles, I mean, I remember um, early on, uh, I was in the elevator in the central office one day and I saw the principal of a school and I had just uh, reviewed the data the day before from the first benchmark assessment and his school was at the absolute bottom. And I said, uh, I just saw the DC bass scores, Not, didn't look good. And it, he was shocked that I actually knew who he was that I had read the data, that I had seen. And I tell you what, the, by the next benchmark assessment, that guy's scores moved. And I think it's because what, I mean, this is a, a, an age old sort of business sort of process that we, or practice that we know, but what gets measured mm -hmm. is what moves. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when, you, when you can articulate what specifically your priorities are and what your expectations are, I think that helps to change start to change the culture. I just want to say one thing to your question too, because I mean, it's a fair question because you have restraints here. But if you lay out clear goals and you figure out how you're going to evaluate people <laughs> and they're going to get a <laughs> exceeds expectations, meet expectations, doesn't meet or whatever it happens to be, when teachers start to get that environment, they start to either want to do really good, but we create an environment where there's no accountability we create an environment where you actually don't even know really who's doing a good job and who's not. So if you take California, we have 300,000 teachers in California. Our data in California, we cannot tell who the top 10% of teachers are or who the bottom 10%. So what you typically would want, the top 10%, you want to reward them, you'd want to have them help mentoring the, the teachers who aren't doing as well. We can't tell who's who. Now, what does that say about California? We wonder why we're at the bottom of the states when it comes to student achievement. So creating that culture ends up helping people say, I don't want to be a part of that, or they start trying to become really good in a hurry. And I think what she did in D.C. was just fabulous because they were able to get rid of tenure. They were able to get rid of seniority and, and, and able to get rid of lockstep pay, which, again, is a very difficult. She slayed the three, you know, three dragons in D.C., which is very difficult to do anywhere. Please. My name is Jason Orta. Um, I'm an alumni of the UC Davis, alumnus of the UC Davis Graduate School of Management, and uh, I've been a resident of Sacramento for 10 years now. Um, the I have a question that both of you can answer, and it's basically in regards to lessons learned in your um, leadership posts. Um, and uh, for Ms. <coughs> Ms. Ree, the question for you is, is in regards to um, Dean Corral's um, statement about um, having a healthy level of conflict. Now, th there is a perception out there, I I've, I've never been a teacher, but there's a perception out there that some of your approaches may be the type that would um, inhibit some kind of collaboration, at least in the form of sharing best practices um, and, g and good ideas across from, you know, different faculty members. How would you find that healthy level of conflict and what have you done to do that? Mm -hmm. And for Mayor Johnson, um, you've alluded to the you know, difficulties of being a mayor of this city and, um, and I'll use one of the examples of one of your initiatives in terms of the strong mayor initiative. What, what were lessons learned that you've learned in negotiating with the council and in trying to sell that idea to the people? What were lessons learned um, from those experiences? Um, I'd say from, from my vantage point, it, you know, it was hard because if, if the dean says there's sort of a, a healthy level of conflict versus no conflict, I think that part of the problem in D.C. when I started was that because there, was, there had been no conflict and everybody was getting along really well, even though we weren't producing results, that, that even the slightest bit of conflict became sort of mm. blown up into more than, than what it was. And, and, um, so let me just give you an example. Were there some teachers who were unhappy with, with what we were doing? Absolutely. But um, this is one interesting data point. You know, through 
the, my first three years, I was trying to negotiate this radical new teachers union contract with the union leadership, the Washington Teachers Union. And um, you know, people all throughout the media sort of hyped this up as you know, sort of the battle of the titans, and you know, we hated the union, that sort of thing. I actually got along very well with the president of our teachers union, and you know, we had to do a little sort of fighting for show or whatever. But we, we liked each other, respected each other quite a bit. Uh, but the, the, the national AFT who was also involved in the negotiations, what they would always say to me was, oh, you know, that's fine that you want those things, but there's no way we're going to get that by our membership. And uh, at the end of the day, after three years of negotiation, when we finally put this uh, on the table, it passed 80% to 20%. 80% of the teachers were absolutely with us, were, had no problem with the, the, the increased accountability for the increased re rewards and recognition. So, you know, I think that the 20% the, the of people who weren't with us and the fact that they were really loud, it created a dynamic that wasn't, that wasn't sort of a holistic picture of how the vast majority of people uh, in the district felt. I think in terms of, where's the gentleman who asked the question? Oh. Way in the back. Um, I think in terms of the Strong Mayor Initiative that, you know, you know, Michelle talked about this earlier. She said that it was easy for her in D.C. to do some of the changes because it was the worst school district in the country. In Sacramento, we are kind of uh, progressing along in a way that's okay and not too bad. And when things are like that, it's very difficult to do something very extreme. Um, so if you want a strong mayor, like if you're being politically smart, you only do strong mayor when there's a crisis, there's a scandal, or somebody's going to jail. When you take something as, as, as polarizing as changing the governance structure in a system like Sacramento, it's just not going to work unless you have something extreme happening. Um, so think about this, because you asked me, how can I convince my colleagues? So when I ran for mayor, I ran against the establishment. I ran against the incumbent mayor. I ran against all the council members who all supported the incumbent mayor. So I didn't have that support going into office. And right when I got elected, I said, I would love to have Sacramento have a governance structure where the mayor is accountable, where the buck stops somewhere. If he does a good job, great. And if he doesn't do a good job, you throw him out. How in the world can you have an environment where a city manager runs a city and has nine bosses that he's trying to make happy every day and we wonder why we don't get things done? It's just a wrong environment because everybody points the finger. But I couldn't get my council members to, at least at that point, think that this was a good idea. And what I was trying to challenge them to do is whether or not you thought it was a good idea, why not let the public vote on it? Why not let the people decide whether they'd like to see this governance structure be changed. I was very confident that if the public got a chance to vote on it, they would have passed it in an overwhelming way. I could not get it on a ballot where the public could vote on it. So government is not gonna reform itself. It's not what it's inclined to do. So what we did was we came up with a ballot initiative, got the necessary signatures to qualify for a ballot, then that initiative got sued by labor and a judge that was a labor judge said it wasn't constitutional, that we were wrong. So then what that leaves you is a system where you can never do things to challenge the current governance system in a city like Sacramento unless all the council members are willing to do it. I just don't feel that that's not democracy um, at its best, and it's been very challenging. Um, when you think about cities our size, you know, 400,000 or bigger, 70% of them have this governance structure. When you have a city manager form of government, it's when you're a much smaller city and you can do things by consensus. But when you need to make decisions, hold people accountable, we've all talked about the importance of human capital. So for me, I can't choose an economic development. I can't choose a chief of police. I can't choose a group of people that I think would carry out a vision and take Sacramento from here to the next level. It's very difficult, very frustrating. It's what I signed up for. Um, I do plan on running for re-election. You know, I haven't announced it yet, but I do plan on running for, <laughs> running for re-election. And, and, and one of the things, I want to be very clear to the public that I would like to run and have this be part of my platform. This be the governance system that I think would be in the best interest of Sacramento. And if people want it, then, you know, elect me, and I will do my best to have us be an effective city within it. And if you don't want it, then don't elect me and elect someone else. I mean, I think the public deserves an honest dialogue. 
and I'm very confident in the, uh, the smarts and the prudence of our community. Because I think most people, I mean, so I, I you know, we, we are obviously together a lot around the city, and I don't think that people in the city, for the most part, know that there is a weak mayor structure. I didn't even know what it was. When he first told me about it, I said, no, 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 honey, let me tell you how a mayor works. Mayor gets to do this, 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 and he's like, no, no, no. I had to look it up on the internet. And when I looked it up, I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. This is, this is who, who, who can run a city like this? And, um, and because people come up to him all the time, they say, mayor, you know, we need more of these things. We need more of this. You need to do this. And Kevin is a good sport, so he's like, yeah, we're going to work on it. And, and people do not know that he is legally, it is illegal for him to give direction to a city employee, to tell a city employee to do something. Do you guys hear that? I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> he, he is not allowed to give a city employee direction. So how could, but, but I think that people, you know, believe that when you elect someone as mayor that they have some kind of authority to do something that you want them to do. And, and that's why I think that it is important to educate the public about the current governance structure and the fact that a man that probably most, most people don't even know who he is and what, what he does every day is, is actually you know, making these decisions on a day-to-day -day basis without any accountability. I think that that is a discussion that the city has to have. Well, we could go uh, on, on and on all night long, so, but, but we can't do that because of time constraints. So I'm gonna allow one more final question. So take us out in a blaze of glory. First of all, thanks to the both of you for participating, and thanks to Dean Corral for hosting it. I, I can't imagine you thought Strong Mayor was going to come up tonight, but uh, he's handled it like a sport. Uh, this question's for the both of Tell you. Tell us who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Daniel Seneca, and I'm a consultant for a Sacramento-based nonprofit called the Institute for Advancing Unity. And I'm curious to know if you've experienced or seen any initiatives uh, that have that focus on improving school climate that have a measurable impact on improving a school's academic performance index or you know just in general improving the academic performance of the individual students and second if the most effective of those programs are you know more peer led or if they're administrative you know zero zero tolerance type policies so I'll say a couple of things uh, first the research is very clear that the one factor that has in school that has the most impact on student achievement levels is the quality of teachers mm -hmm. in the school every day. Mm -hmm. And um, this is an interesting statistic. Uh, an economist did a study uh, that basically showed that if we in America took the bottom performing six to 10 percent of teachers and replaced them just with average teachers, that we would propel the country from where we are now, near the bottom on math, et cetera, to near the top, just with that one action. So that shows you the power that teachers have. And I think people often underestimate how incredibly difficult it is to be a great teacher. Um, there is, in my, in my mind, nothing, no job that is more important in this country than, than our public school teachers. Uh, we don't pay them enough. We don't recognize and reward them enough. But um, we, so we, we I believe that we've, we've got to be focused a lot on that. Um, I'd say the second thing in terms of school culture and climate, and, and, and the mayor can talk about this as well because this is something that they did extraordinarily well at Sac High when it was a failing school, uh, is, is instead of the, 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 the way that we ran things in DC when I first got there was very reactive, right? So um, it, in schools that were the most troubled, where you would see the most discipline problems, et cetera, we'd put more police officers there. And um, it was our, our, my student cabinet who came to us and said, do you all think that having more police makes us feel safer? Because it actually doesn't. It makes us feel worse. Um, and so what we tried to do was start pilot programs where schools could take some of the money that we normally spent on these police officers and these security guards and actually put them into proactive strategies you know, peer mediation and conflict resolution and, and the things that would uh, proactively help kids to, to figure out how to work through problems before they turn violent. And working on some of the social skills and, and the ability to do that, we thought was just a, a better uh, investment of money. So I'll, I'll just have a simple answer. Um, in, in thinking about leaving this group here, you hear us talk about leadership and human capital 
you hear us talking about culture, how important culture is, and how important uh, data and accountability and results. You know, that's what we uh, just believe so strongly in. So when I think about an environment, I think about the culture you create, and it really starts with kids that have high expectations. You have to have really high expectations for kids at the end of the day. You have to believe every kid in every neighborhood can do equally as well as any kid in any neighborhood if they have access to high quality education. That's not happening in our country. We don't wanna make excuses, don't use poverty as an excuse, all that's hogwash. It just is not accurate. We have kids in Sacramento right now, Oak Park, 95% African Americans are outperforming kids in Granite Bay right now because they have great teachers, high expectations, longer school day, and they believe. If you go outside our kindergartner's door right now in PS7, it'll say 2027 the year they're graduating for college. There is no doubt in their mind that they're going to college and no one can tell them any different. They've been to UC Davis probably more times than I've been to UC Davis on a college trip. I mean, seriously. So that's part of the high expectation. The other part that's important is this notion of choice and commitment. You have to create accountability and commitment from everybody. So at this elementary school, we have a three-way contract between a parent, between a teacher, and a student and they all sign this contract of what they're going to do. Homework, longer school day, can't watch TV until you take care of your business, always tell the truth. That notion of accountability and commitment is really important. So I'm in a, I'm in a uh, what do you call it, blockbuster? I'm in a blockbuster, is that what they're called? I'm in a blockbuster, uh, what do they call it? I'm in a blockbuster movie rental place. <laughs> and we're, uh, I'm walking around trying to find a movie to pick. And this parent comes up to me and she goes, are you Kevin Johnson? This is before I got elected mayor. And I'm like, maybe. Yeah, thinking about what the, <laughs> so she's, I know you are. She's yelling at me from across this blockbuster. So finally she goes, I send my kid to Sac High, your high school, and I used to like it and I don't like it anymore. You wanna know why? <laughs> Please. She goes, my, my kid got suspended. My son got suspended. And at this point, I'm not going to be able to enjoy my movie at this point. So I'm like, so why did your son get suspended? My son got suspended just because. No, no. Why, tell me why your son got suspended. Because he was wearing a hat indoors. It's okay. I said, let me ask you a couple questions. Is there a rule in a student handbook that says your son shouldn't wear hats indoors? Yes. Did you not sign that commitment to say you're gonna follow all the rules that are in that handbook? Yes, we did, but this is different. Okay, what's different? He just shouldn't be suspended for wearing a hat indoors. Is it the first time he was told not to wear a hat? No. Second time, no. Third time, no. I said, let me just make it really simple and then I'm gonna go watch my movie. If you think it's more important for your son to wear a hat in school, then go to college, then I would take my kid out of school. Parent was like, you know what, that's a great point. I, I, I can't wait to get home and tell my son how dumb he's being for work. <laughs> the, the point is, the point is, parents want high expectations for their kids. If you allow them to get away with breaking stupid rules and not even holding them accountable, then they'll do it. But once you tell a parent, if wearing a hat is more important than going to college, I understand that. No parent wants that. So while she's talking about you know, what Michelle talked about, at the end of the day, it all boils down to high expectations as well. And that's kind of the culture that we need to create. And I think it's the culture we're trying to create in the city of Sacramento. We don't want to just be a normal city. We want to be a world-class destination city. And oftentimes, I get in arguments with people who you know, sometimes feel like they're not ready for it. And I'm just not going to uh, allow that to be the case. We want to be. Uh, capital of California and we want to act like it and we want to sit up straight and make people understand what that means in Sacramento. <laughs> so I hope you agree with me. This, is, this has been an absolutely riveting discussion listening to the leadership lessons of both Michelle and Kevin. So uh, please join me again in thanking them for all their uh, insights.
And we have uh, two little tokens of our appreciation to you. There's one is uh, UC Davis vinegar and one is UC Davis olive oil. So those are from us, uh, thanking you very much for being with us. And uh, I just wanted to thank you all again for coming tonight. It's been a terrific event. Um, and uh, this, this event will be on our website. The, uh, the video from it will be on the Graduate School of Management's website uh, by early next week. So I just want to now uh, invite all of you to stick around. We have uh, reception and, and food and drink in the back. So please join us. And uh, again, thanking uh, Michelle and Kevin for their remarks. Terrific.